Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Sixto Wagen. I am uh, the Director for the Center for Art and Social Engagement, and I'm thrilled to have you all here today. Um, first, um, I, before we begin and do more of our introductions, I want to say that um, the work of the fellowship and the Project Grow Houses are based in Third Ward, Houston. It's one of Houston's historically African-American neighborhoods, and we recognize the residents of that neighborhood and our neighborhood, and our work supports the histories and the lived experiences of that place and its people. Center for Garden Social Engagement, um, otherwise known as CASE and Project Row Houses, understand the privilege of sharing stewardship um, with the Karankawa, Akokisa, Atakapa Ishak, Tonkawa, Sana, Koibuitikan First Nations, where we gather on, on their unceded land. We acknowledge and honor the indigenous people's guardianship of the coastal plains, the bayous, lakes, rivers, within and beyond the campus as sites of ancestral homeland. Everything built here originates from their presence and knowledge, and from this understanding, our future will derive. Sydney? Thank you, Six Toe. Um, again, before we get started, um, I will go ahead and go through our digital land acknowledgement, which is inspired by Adrian Wong, artistic director of Kingston-based Spire Web Show Performance. Her original digital land acknowledgement can be found on her website. Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies structures and way of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high speed internet not available to many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints contributing to changing climates and disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. I invite you to join us in acknowledging all of this as well as our shared responsibility to make good at this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. Thank you, Sydney. Um, as I said before, my name is Sixto Wagen. I go by he, him pronouns. For those of you who don't have video, um, I am uh, coming from my home office presenting as a Filipino American gay man with a uh, gray beard and um, an orchid behind me. Um, and I am Grateful for all of you all to be here, and I'm going to pass this over to, to um, Sydney. Thank you, Sydney. I mean, six to. I am Sydney Maureen Garrett um, from Project Row Houses. I am curatorial assistant and art coordinator. Thank you all for being here today. I am also in Houston, Texas, um, currently sitting in my office slash bedroom area. Um, I do live in a small apartment, so many of these spaces are duo. Um, I am in an olive green kind of shirt uh, with gold hoops and glasses. And I will go ahead and pass it to Jose Eduardo. Hi, everyone. My name is Jose Eduardo Sanchez. I'm a language worker and cultural organizer based out of here in Houston, Texas as well, uh, calling in from my uh, home in North Houston. Uh, here they pronouns are are great. And uh, yeah, I'm also coming in from my room. There's a beautiful uh, rainbow mosaic owl that one of my dear friends made for me. Um, and I am wearing glasses, shaved head, and wearing a floral shirt. Um, yeah, and, and really excited to be here with y'all to talk about well, our lessons, our challenges, our hopes for the future. Um, yeah, thank you. Nicoletta? Hi, I am Nicoletta Derita de la Brown. My preferred pronouns are she, they. I am coming from Baltimore, Maryland. I am in my whole throne in my house. Yes, I sit in the throne. Yes, that is fact. I am a Panamanian woman. I am pansexual. I am happy to be here and I'm ready to get started. Thanks, everybody. Um, so uh, as a reminder, again, we are uh, we are recording this. And if you don't want to be uh, um, on the recording, uh, you can just go ahead and keep your video off and just throw your information in the chat. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I, 
this is going, only going to be in English and we are monolinguist and I apologize for my, um, my failures and the fact that I can only uh, speak in English. I can hear other languages and kind of respond, but not enough in order to actually carry on a consistent conversation. So um, just kind of as a guidepost for the rest of the day, um, we are gonna do a bit of recap of uh, Nicoletta's and his, Jose Eduardo's um, fellowship and talk about kind of the learnings and the challenges that have happened over the course of the past, like, you know, 2020. Um, particularly thinking about um, how, uh, what does that mean for a community engaged practice? How do we engage community in virtual spaces? And also um, when communities are suffering from compounded traumas. Um, there's a lot that we can learn and then a lot that we're actually going to use from that learning in order to be able to move forward. And at, toward the end of today, like, you know, we will have a question and answer session with uh, Nicoletta and Jose Eduardo. Um, but toward the end, we are going to be able to celebrate kind of the moment by being able to introduce our 2021 fellow. So that's kind of the signposts uh, signpost of, um, of our afternoon. And I, I will go ahead and I'll turn this over to um, Sydney. Thank you, Sixco. Um, before we get really into the conversation, um, some people may already know, some may not, but for those who don't, um, Nicoletta, Nicoletta and Jose Eduardo, do you mind um, recapping the previous 2020 Fellows Artist Conversation um, that we released on video about a week ago, I believe? Um, just kind of go through maybe three minutes each or together. Um, oh, Sixco did also just drop the link in the chat for those that might want to revisit that video later. Um, but if you don't mind, just kind of giving us a quick rundown of what you already spoke about previously. Well, I mean, I'll start and I want to pass it off to uh, a human being that I love with my whole body, Jose Eduardo. It really was a conversation between friends. I think for me, the first moment I met Jose Eduardo, I was like, oh, wait, you exist? Where have you been my whole life? Wow. And that's literally the energy we, we've had. The thing that happened with COVID was that we weren't able to have access to each other. I am not based in Houston. I was a fellow that was invited into a space that I treasure and I can't wait to go back to. Third Ward is so special. So part of that conversation was two artists who've happened to grow into a friendship, sharing a journey about what it's been like to be a fellow in a program that we honestly at times felt like we couldn't really participate in because of the whole world's pause. And so that's how it started. It was a beautiful tea. We had tea over Zoom. That was a whole thing. And we really just were sharing. So hopefully other people get to watch it and just see this exchange of energy that we shared with each other. Just us kind of like processing and giving through exchange the information that we felt in our bodies. Um, Jose Eduardo, what are your thoughts? <laughs> Definitely, thank you, Nicoletta. Yeah, we. I think um, echoing everything Nicoletta just shared, for me, it was really beautiful to discover all of the ways that we had continued being connected, or rather articulate the ways that we were continuing to be connected through our work um, of healing, through our embodiment, through the different languages that we share amongst ourselves. And I think that that um, was a really powerful way for, for us to, to reconnect. I, I don't want to say to end this fellowship because I think we'll, we'll talk about this later, but there's so much more that's coming. But yeah, just situating it within the context of uh, artists who are doing social engaged practice during very, very um, extraordinary times and what that has felt like, what that has tasted like, what that has sounded like, what that has moved like in our bodies. And um, yeah, and, and also just sharing an offering for everyone else listening, right? The idea of um, putting forth that energy, but also putting forth that, um, those challenges, those lessons, those hopes for our work and hopefully for our community's work as well. So I guess, you know, part of what I think we're going to engage in right now is just uh, to talk a little like um, Sydney, like Nicoletta, Jose and Wardo and I are going to talk a little bit more about just kind of questions and, 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 and learnings and kind of wonderings that, you know, sparked not only from the, the video conversation, but just the entire experience over the course of um, the past, I don't know, 
35 years uh, during COVID, because um, that's what it was both 35 and just the same day. Um, but I think that one of the things that I guess I wanted to raise up, to, like, you know, Jose Eduardo and Nicoletta, uh, both of you all actually spoke a bit in the, the video about a, both a privilege and kind of a burden of being a fellow during during this time and and, and acknowledging the fact that um, there is an expectation of, from the fellowship, but then there's also the struggle of be, having to be be present in your own realities and the own company, like the own issues, the own uh, like you know the um, to to actually having to process not only COVID, not only all these, but also the the realities of your families and the realities of like you know everybody's health. And so I guess um, I think that to me it also brings up an ongoing question for all of us who are working in community and community engaged practice, like there is a both a desire to do more to an expectation and the feeling that we can and we should be doing more but also an understanding of like how when when is enough enough to be be present in this moment so i guess i i pose that in order to kind of just as a as see if there's any type of response that nicoletta sydney or jose eduardo would like to add uh, add into that yeah i mean for me it I've had conversations with myself. I'm having conversations with my daughters. I, I'm a black woman. I'm very aware of the body I was born in. And one thing that I have been asked over and over again by society, by, by culture, by my community is to show up. It's like, oh, we need you. You need to nurture us. You need to care for us. You need to, you need to heal our wounds. And that is like something that I watch my grandmother do, my mother do, my, my tias do. Like I, I watch aunties, I watch everybody who look like me care for others. But I noticed that we were not on the top of our list. It was like, well, when do I lay down? When do I mourn things? When do I cry? When do I say, I don't know what to do? And so that was a very challenging thing for me as a black woman, as a mother of four children, as an artist, as a community engaged person, a person who believes that my gifts, part of them are supposed to be given to others when that was not allowed because of social distancing, because it was unsafe to be in space, I started to wonder, do I exist? And if I do exist, do I have value? Those were questions that I was not expecting to be asking myself as an artist, nor do I feel like it was something that we should be asking ourselves as human beings, because that is not, I exist and I, yes, I have value, but because no one was telling me, oh, you are producing something, you are, you are experiencing some kind of labor, therefore I can assign this thing to you and say, good job, you did this. So this is a conversation where as an artist also, I was not making, I was not flexing my muscles, I was not in the studio, I was just trying to process life. And so Jose Eduardo and I have had many exchanges. Sometimes it was just a text. Sometimes it was a voice memo. Sometimes it was a conversation. Sometimes it was a video chat where we said, wow, I just need to check in with you. Are you okay? Like, are you okay? And if the answer was no, that's okay too. So that's something that I've been thinking about and I've been learning to say no, because honestly, I need a whole break and I don't know how long it's going to be, but I need a whole break. Thank you for that, Nicoletta. Kind of adding on to that, um, you know, as a Black woman myself, a mixed Black woman in particular, um, you know, I've, I've always kind of felt this need to be doing, you know, doing the work, as they say, whatever that means. Um, and I think this pandemic, you know, it, it's made us all slow down and really reflect in ways that we haven't before. And also as someone who has like, you know, mental disabilities and going through a lot in my head, right? This, I think this past year has made me realize that sometimes there are days where all I can do is get out of bed, hopefully brush my teeth, wash my face, hopefully feed myself. And that can be enough as well, right? Like I, I used to be someone who really measured myself on the products that I could make, whether that's through work, whether that's through art, um, wherever that may be. But this past year, I was like, no, sometimes just being able to get up and feed myself and wash the crust out of my eyes is enough. 
and that's okay. So yeah. I am um, during many of the conversations, you know, within the university, because we had a lot of work that was going on, um, trying to rethink community, and also um, after the murder of George Floyd, and 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 the, and the the renewed racial reckoning and accountability aspects, um, the university, I have to say, like I mean, the College of the Arts, made made transparent a lot of work that um, I. I needed to have been made transparent and actually raised it and centered it. And, and at one of those meetings, Rick Lowe, co-founder of Project Row Houses, actually said, this is the work. This is the work that we are doing, the social justice work, the, the work about equity, that is actually the work that we are doing. And that all of the other tasks in terms of what we have been having with is, um, you know, like all of like, you know, all, all the classes and all that, that is part of it. But really the work is how do we actually be with each other as human beings? Yeah, so, and six. So I think you, um, you know, thank you to Nicoletta and, and Sydney for sharing that, and I definitely echo um, some of what they shared too. And I think six. So you, you actually mentioned this in one of our check-ins, right? The idea of survival as success. Um, and I know that sounds so basic and so simple, but that's actually quite a, a complex thing to be able, not just to experience, but also to hold, right? To, to be able to accept. I think that, you know, similarly coming from this desire for production and whether it's artistic production, production uh, in terms of, you know, the, the um, just the labor of caring, right? I think there's a lot of expectations for production and there's not as much emphasis on, on processing and on practice. And I think a lot about the one of the biggest lessons that I'm taking away from, from this fellowship and this in the, in these times is the idea of the word practice. And not just in terms of artistic practice, social practice, but practice as something that we do over and over again with each other, with ourselves, as part of, of each other and, or, and ourselves. And through that practice, we reflect, we learn, we keep evolving. And yeah, sure, there are things that may come out of it that are that might be tangible. There are things that may come out of it that we're able to identify and articulate. But really for me, the practice of has become really, really important. And, and again, you know, part of this this fellowship was really, really key in being able to to accept that and, and embrace that as well. I wanted to add on to that real quick because we've had that conversation, Jose Eduardo, about practice because ritual is important to both of us. And, and we really fortified the boundaries around our rituals for ourselves. Also, process over outcome. That was something I reminded myself over and again process over outcome. I am just creating because art is my first language. It's not because I'm trying to produce for a show. I'm not even trying to necessarily get to a point where it's something that I would share with anyone else. I am using the ritual, the practice of my art to process something without the expectation of any kind of outcome. As soon as I release that from my body, I realized that it was mine. My body is mine and the things happening inside, the feelings, the emotions, and also the way that I am presenting myself to the world, I have agency and therefore it is process over outcome. Also, I think that, um, the word practice also creates opportunity for failure right and that that there's like that and that, 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 that like it kind of helps to free us from this expectation of what success is and actually redefine and then i think that um one of the things that you know after watching the video like you know your conversation the the idea about ritual the idea about setting you all up, up um i mean like we talked about it a lot nicoletta we talked about it and like you know and i think jose eduardo like i think that even from the video i think you came to a realization even at a certain point when nicoletta was like what you just said was actually ritual right and that and and to actually identify it as a ritual or identify it as a practice was significant and i think that um to me like as nicoletta as you were also saying was that we what we were talking about was also 
an essential grounding and that allowed it for an openness to to whatever would happen, right? And so that like in terms of like the failure or just like, it is not about, I guess it is um, the free the freedom from an expectation of an outcome and, and actually a presence within the, the questions and, the, and, and, and within the intention. So I guess, you know, some of that like, that continues to resonate and will continue to resonate as we are thinking about the, the, the fellowship and all this community engaged practice forward. But are there other ways that you all want to kind of expound on kind of just kind of the revelations about intention, the revelations about ritual? I'm just, I'm processing your question because I'm like, oh, this is, this is in real time. Um, part of me is also considering the fact that as I think about ritual, it's ever it's evolving. I'm not the same person I was yesterday. I'm not gonna be the same person tomorrow. I'm definitely not the same person you met in 2019. I can tell you that. I don't know who she is. She, I met a long time ago. So part of what I'm also allowing myself to, to do is know that rituals shift as I shift. And the other thing is to remind myself that the rituals that I create really should be supporting me because this is something that we we often forget we forget to stop something right so basically what i'm saying is as a woman who grew up in this body and this skin when i watch things on the news or when i watch things in media if it looks like me i feel it in my body and often we say hold on i don't feel comfortable but we don't articulate it we don't even stop to say, what do I need right now? That is a part of the ritual. And sometimes the ritual is a soothing in the moment. So what I'm learning to myself is it doesn't have to be this ritual where I have taken a lot of time to develop it. It's literally like, what can I do right this second in this moment to process or to feel better or to soothe or to feel connected? A ritual could be me reaching out to Jose Eduardo and checking in. That ritual takes seconds. Another ritual could be me doing something that is elaborate that takes months. So part of, I think, where I was redefining the concept of ritual is some of them are very elaborate with multiple steps. Some of them are based in ancient practice. Some of them I got from family members, right? I, because I'm Panamanian. Some of them are based in culture. Some of them are based in humanity. And what do I as a human being need right now? So I think that was where my rituals expanded because I realized that I needed to be thinking about how they could show up in all aspects. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Nicoletta, for that, because I think, again, in, in our interaction, a lot of our interactions, a lot of our connections were really critical points of, of reminders, right? Almost of, of remind, even when we couldn't articulate it or didn't articulate it, that quick text, that, you know, that short voice message became part of of something else as well as like held so much in and of itself i think for me one of the biggest examples of shifting or transforming the way that i approach uh rituals and the meaning for me is around my language work uh part of the part of the work that i do includes you know creating multilingual spaces holding multilingual spaces so that folks can connect um, across languages, across cultures and, and build together. And I realized, right, that I, I became much more in tune with the way that holding those types of spaces actually requires so much emotional, mental and spiritual labor for me. And the fact that I need to be compassionate for to myself and the fact that I need to as much as I'm holding space for others, acknowledge that as a language worker, those are things that are moving through my body. And I can't just check out after, you know, after I turn off the mic or after I walk away from an event, right? So honoring that. And also this, this is part of the question that I was exploring at the beginning of this fellowship, the idea of, you know, whose social practice gets to count as art right? And whose art is deemed valuable. And I think so much of what I discovered over the past year are these things that have been passed down, again, like 
uh, through my family, through the women in my family, particularly through other people that I am in community with, uh, or just through my experience of being a human navigating this world. And, and there is no requirement for that, you know, kind of, kind of like what you're saying, Nicola, that there's no requirement for you to have to write a two page artist statement or over intellectualize the ways that we survive and thrive and connect to each other. Yet I felt so much of that pressure, you know, externally, not 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 necessarily within, you know, within folks here, but externally. And I go back to that question, like whose social practice gets to kind of art. And I think that that's something that I keep, you know, I keep asking myself and I keep reminding myself of because so much of this comes from those community connections, from those familial connections, from those lineages that we come from. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. And I think it's important to name that, particularly within um, these kinds of spaces, particularly within these types of institutions that sometimes don't see the value in that type of, in that type of work or that type of showing up. I think um, both Jose Eduardo and Nicoletta, you touched on this a little bit, um, but I do want to dive a little bit deeper into, and you touched on this in the video as well, um, the ideas of reimagining and honoring space um, and action versus replacing. Um, you know, during the pandemic specifically, um, a lot of things got shut down, a lot of things got canceled, and we did, we did see some um, folks, some desire of people wanting to return back to normal or replace whatever was once there with something else. Um, and you both mentioned, like, we should really take a pause and instead of thinking about replacing, thinking about honoring that space um, or reimagining what that space looks like. And so I'm kind of curious to know what does that look like specifically in your practice? And again, as Jose Eduardo just mentioned, we can look at practice as a broader term, um, but what, what does that look like for the both of you? Well, um, for me, like I, I am based in Baltimore. So there are a lot of decommissioned Confederate monuments that are basically these platform spaces that in a way leave a residue. Because it's like when something's missing, you're looking at it saying like, I know something was there and therefore what was it and why was it unsafe? So I started to have these conversations with myself of this space feels unsafe. It feels like I'm not supposed to be here. So what I did intentionally was I would go to that space on a daily basis. I would sit with my energy like, why am I drawn here? What is it telling me? I stopped trying to assign it something and started to listen. Then I brought ritual to the space that would make me feel like it was mine, but in a soft way, in a gentle way, not putting on a production, not creating a performance art piece, not creating an installation, but instead bringing practice, bringing ritual that I could do. And it was really about me expanding the space that I considered safe. Now, what I started to notice that happened because I was doing this every single day people outside would start to see me and they would then begin to create ritual in that space. And we had conversations, social distance, mind you, six feet apart, but we would have these conversations around why these spaces needed to feel safer. We weren't trying to solve a big issue. We were actually, as neighbors, communicating that we identify with that space not feeling safe. And we began to create rituals and I created my own and then I would watch them do theirs. And then it became a practice where I would go and I would do some ritual. I would document it through photography, through video. And it was only for research for me, meaning it does end up living in an archive and now become a space where it can inform future work. But it really was just a gift from me to me. And I was able to use ritual practices that I learned from mi abuela, my grandmother, my mom, in the kitchen, in a bodega, or in, you know, on the stoop about how to make spaces safe. And that's where, instead of me trying to fix a problem, I was just trying to figure out what was going on and allowing the ritual to be 
the catalyst for conversation, mostly with myself, but then it actually started to bring together others that I would never have connected with in my community. Yeah, I, I love that, Nicoleta, because I think a lot about, I mean, when you talk about research, when you, when you call that research, that just filled my heart because, you know, I, I wish we didn't have to be a part of a fellowship to approach our lives, our daily lives, through this lens of research, right? Through this lens of research for who we want to become as human beings, for who we are in community. So I just want to uplift that. Um, but the other thing too, I mean, I think a lot about um, how as soon as, you know, when the pandemic started and things started shutting down physically, there was this initial reaction of, okay, we need to get the Zooms, the Microsoft Teams, like the virtual, et cetera, et cetera. And what struck me about that is that, well, one, there was, one was just the urgency. Like there was no time in between that to transition into this drastically different way of being and engaging with each other. But two, it was approached from such a um, framework of deficiency, right? Of and, and I think deficiency in terms of what we can't do versus like what other opportunities does this um, new setup give give us? And I think that that actually, you know, even a specific example of being in a meeting on Zoom and seeing people who had never, who would have never shown up to an in-person meeting, maybe because it was never physically accessible, maybe because, you know, no one ever offered childcare and they couldn't leave their kids at home, or maybe because there was just something away about the way they connect with folks that, you know, made it easy to do it virtually. And I think that made me, the deficiency approach um, also exposed to me what the, our structures and our systems really deem as deficient um, and who they deem as deficient, who finally was able to uh, access specific spaces that they should have been in there to begin with. So I think that's one really, um, you know, this really particular example of like, how can we think about not just replacing X with Y, but transforming X into so, you know, just this endless realm of possibility. Um, and I, I appreciate one particular space that I was able to be part of with, um, with folks virtually, which was a, a, a writing group that uh, some, some friends and some friends and I started called writing against oblivion, right? Like this idea of using writing as a, a as a process, as a portal, as a way to travel to each other um, when we were staring at each other through, through screens. And so that, you know, that to me really helped me conceptualize and, and feel and, and, and actually experience what it looks like when we move from just replacing to actually transforming spaces um, and what do we want those transformations to look like. Thank you, Jose Eduardo. Um, so we're going to um, ask uh, actually one more question in order to engage everybody in this conversation. And then we're going to open up to Q&A. So I think one of the things that um, I encourage you all to do is start thinking about other questions or other kind of responses that you'd like to share as we open up, open it up in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, and and thank you, Robin, for, for the quote that you put into the chat. We can bring it, we'll um, raise it up in a little bit, but just wanted to just give everybody a heads up that we're going to open it up to Q&A, get your questions, um, start thinking and articulating your questions. And then, but I'm going to turn it over to Sydney for kind of this last question in this, in this part. Thank you, Sixto. Um, so for the last question, you know, I want to reiterate that this fellowship program um, is not based around a final product. Right, we are a research fellowship. We are here to um, support ongoing ideas um, of artists, ongoing meaning during the fellowship, that idea is going to shift and change and move with the time. And then beyond the fellowship, we're supporting um, the continuation of that thought, right? Um, and so I think that process has made um, this past year, it's made it easier for all of us this past year to move with ease. Um, because we all kind of knew that we're not gearing towards one final thing, 
right? Um, so with that being said, as our ideas are shifting and changing, um, and they still are to this day, even though we are at the virtual closing, um, I'm wondering what what learnings are you taking with you from the fellowship um, and bringing back to your own communities, right? Of course, we are third who are focused, but we also acknowledge that we are a part of a multitude of communities. Um, and, and so what, what are you taking from this fellowship and bringing back and spreading into other communities um, that you're also involved with? Um, I, I can I can share. Um, I there there are four things that I, I hope to share right now. I, I wrote them down, but I'm really excited about the way that um, I discovered a sonic element or a sonic component to food that I was not expecting through through my through my research through my experiences in this fellowship. So that's absolutely something that I want to continue exploring. Um, as as ritual as as practice, and also experiment with that in terms of my my artistic practice. I also very very much connected to that the idea of expanding language beyond what we can speak and hear and um, or sign or read or write, but rather language beyond humanness, language beyond this individual um, necessity for self-realization, but language as a way to discover things that might not be translatable to us right now, but that we are able to learn um, through through practice. And, and two very particular ones that I that I definitely want to uplift. One of them is, you know, I've gotten to connect with HSED, which for folks who don't know is the um, the Coalition for Equitable Displacement with uh, for Equitable <laughs> Development Without Displacement. Um, there are a brilliant, brilliant group that is doing really uh, amazing and necessary organizing work to get a community benefits agreement for um, the new development that is in the outskirts um, of Third Ward, but obviously has a, a, is part of the the Third Ward community for the for the Rice Ion. So if you don't know about HSED. Um, I'm, I can drop something in the chat. They're doing brilliant work, and I'm, you know, I just want to share my commitment to continue supporting that that type of uh, transformation. And then, lastly, you know, thinking about food and this idea of um, what are things that we can't just replace, we have to transform. Uh, you might have seen this on social media. You might have seen this in person, going to a restaurant, right? Signs that say. We are understaffed. Uh, oh, you know, we're, we're closed because there aren't enough workers. Um, and creating this narrative of, you know, people are lazy, they don't want to get back to work, uh, or folks are just too comfortable with unemployment. But the idea, you know, remembering and, and highlighting the idea that food, the food industry, food workers are some of the most exploited um, in, in our society, that food. Um, as Tunde Wei says, food is a, is a site of exploitation, and we can approach that, and being something so critical to our everyday, I think we can approach that way more critically. So definitely exploring more ways that I can be in solidarity with food workers, um, and in solidarity as they continue to fight to transform food systems um, that, we, that we rely on, and food systems that we need for our survival and for our uh, prosperity in, in our community. So, yeah. You, you can actually share what that, that, that list with all of us, right? Because I'm like, that, like that, that's a lot, just on those four points, but great. Like, Nicoletta? Thank you for sharing all of that. And Jose Eduardo always inspires me. I'm like, okay, listen, you have four, here we go. Because I, I always, this is how it works. I'm like, he said something breath breathtaking and then I, I think about how I can respond in honoring the space that you created. So thank you, Jose Eduardo. So I, I have four. Um, the first thing I have on my list is rest. Matt dropped that in the chat. Uh, it was also dropped in the chat by someone else. Let me see, I wanna acknowledge all. Robin, thank you for that quote. So part of it is rest. And I just said rest, like that's it. I can expand on that if you like. But the reality was that part of what I needed to remind myself of in my practice is how important rest is. Just 
taking time to rest because in the rest, that's where I even found my joy. That's where I found my peace. That's where I found my healing. That's where I found um, the ability to even acknowledge the things that I wasn't seeing, things that I felt really proud of that I hadn't even given myself space to see. So rest. The second thing that I'm taking with me is my tea ritual. So when I met Jose Eduardo, tea and ritual and food shifted completely for me when I watched your presentation around why we gather and how food connects us. So one thing that I completely eliminated immediately was any business meetings or any social meetings over food. When I break bread with someone, it's because we are having a soul conversation. It's a spiritual thing. So I don't have business meetings where we meet for lunch. Uh-uh, because -uh, I'm nourishing my whole body. Why am I going to slow down that process by trying to focus on what someone is trying to tell me? And usually it's because they're trying to convince me of something. That's what business is about. It's about we're having this exchange where we're trying to get to a resolve, like a point in the middle. But when I'm eating, nourishing my body, I'm actually supposed to be slowing down to allow di digestion to fully take form. So when I sit down with Jose Eduardo or Sydney or Sixto, it's because I wanna exchange with them and we're breaking bread and we are nourishing ourselves and holding space. So that's a big thing. These rituals around food completely shifted and it's become a part of my practice. The third thing for me is normalizing humanity in all business practices. And I say that that is for real. I no longer engage in any practice business, I don't care how big the check is, I don't care who the institution is. Listen, I have had a conversation with the Kennedy Center this week, they called me twice about something and I said, the answer is still no, because this space does not honor my humanity. And we are not having conversations that feel kind. They were like, what? That's the answer. So get yourself together and you can give me a call. I am not going to sign a contract, an agreement, do something where I know that it is damaging someone else or me. End of it. Humanity is at the top of my business list. I don't care who it is. The fourth thing is I am exploring ways that I can honor my practices, my rituals, and share them with those who want to be at my performances. So my practice as an artist before COVID was to engage with large groups of people in public space, museums, festivals, events. I would have hundreds of people around me for an extended period of time. That's not possible. Instead of me trying to reimagine how that looks, what I did was I started taking my rituals to spaces that were soothing. I started going to the woods and just spending time in nature and documenting the rituals that I was doing that no one ever saw and deciding how could I extract some of the magic? How could I extract the essence, make it cinematic and reshare that out? How does that look? So for me, what I gained was the ability to have these beautiful moments for myself and potentially when honored, share those practices with others in new ways through projections on large scale, like large scale projections on walls and galleries and museum spaces, virtually or digitally now. So that's something that's brand new. It's my way of saying, how can I still have my practice be engaging? How can I still have moments with other people, but still remain safe, emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually? So those are all the things. So thank you, Jose Eduardo, for the for the four. I think Nicoletta, like one of the things that just uh, everybody, like in terms of uh, this option, we've been thinking about uh, about sharing, right? And we the, the, that the the idea, the essential idea is like we all need to be rested and actually be present in order to be able to share fully. And I think just kind of how do we reinforce that, that that moment of like where how can we be 
if we are not rested, if we do not actually understand who we are uh, as ourselves, how do, if we cannot understand how we operate, how can we actually expect to be human and to expect other people to be human with us? And I think, you know, in this, um, in, in this option of like, as we continue to think forward through uh, this, and I, you know, I guess we're gonna leave it with also with all of you all, how are we taking these moments from COVID, from this pandemic, from this, all these, the, um, the, the necessary like reckonings that are happening, how do we acknowledge ourselves? How do we acknowledge this? And how do we create a space that we want to exist again and not a space that, like, a space that we are, are forced to, or, or, or that we, that we're forced to and like, you know, and, and what, how do we acknowledge and accept those, that agency in this? And, you know, and part of this is that, you know, Sydney and I, in terms of like, as organizational, like as, as institutional representatives um, have the opportunity in order to do this, but also this is one of the significant aspects for the fellowship. Like, how are we sharing out this? How are we sharing out this, this opportunity? And how do other artists within the community, how do community members also respond to us and actually, you know, help us be this way, help us actually develop this and demand that of us, ourselves and each other in order to be and exist in this, into that space. Um, we have the opportunity to think of that in project row houses. We have that opportunity to potentially exist that within our own neighborhoods and within our own homes. How do we help each other and build a network to strengthen us to, to make that a reality for all of us, not just because of a fellowship. So um, I've created, like I've opened up the opportunity for if anybody wants to join in on the video or also un unmute themselves in order to be able to ask questions or also just go ahead and if you don't want to uh, to do that and put your voice into the space, understandable, and you can just throw it up into the chat um, and we'll be able to respond to it in this way um, and facilitate that. So I, I will go back and just kind of like, a, you know, and, and ask a, Robin, if you want to actually read that quote, or if you want to, like, you know, or we can read read the quote that you shared in the uh, in the chat. Um, I'll give you a second. Um, okay, so you're not popping up yet. So I'm just going to go ahead and grab, like, you know, in, in this aspect of. Uh, okay, thanks, Robin. And like, I'll just go ahead and, and and just kind of speak the words that you put into the chat. The quote that has helped me rest and practice, so to speak. Be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. So thank you for that, Robin. And if you can actually uh, share at some point, give us the, the, the person who, like, you know, and the, where that quote came from, that would be wonderful. And it's great to see um, people in the community coming in and, and uh, being part of this space um, in the chat room in, in this aspect. Um, other, you know, there's just a, a lot to process over the course of the past year and a lot to like, you know, um, uh, of, of wisdom reflection that Nicoletta and Jose Eduardo and Sydney have actually shared with us um, today. And so I, again, this is, we would continue to refer these as conversations because we recognize that this is this is not an end. This is just an ongoing part of the practice and part of the sharing and part of the knowledge. Um, and so, I hopefully we will continue to have more conversations, uh, both virtually, in person, and you know, uh, in other spaces, as it makes sense for us to be able to exist in that. Other questions, other comments that you know, anybody in the group wants to raise up or emphasize? Well, one thing I just want to say that um, something that we were doing because this is the first time that we're sharing our check-ins or these like these touch-based moments with other people. I think that what became normal was asking how you're doing, but really asking like at the beginning. It's like. Yeah, we're all in Zoom and Zoom fatigue is real. And, and, you know, we are sitting with each other. And even though I can't physically give you a hug or embrace you, I can ask you, how are you doing? And it doesn't have to be like, there's been times, Sixto, where I said, you've asked me and I said, I don't want to unpack it here, but thank you for asking me. Like, that's a real statement. 
or when you say I'm great or I'm not good, whatever the answer is, letting that be okay. Not feeling like we have to fix it, not feeling like we have to change things, but acknowledging that we're coming to this space wherever we are. And the reality is we have to be mindful of the fact that we are in each other's home. I have never had so many people in my house than this time. I'm sitting on a throne on purpose because I don't want to remind people that I know I'm a goddess without saying a word. But the reality is these are our sacred spaces. Normally we're having these meetings and we go to an institution or we go to a public space or we, now we're in your home. And when I turn off Zoom, I'm by myself or I'm with my family, my kids are here. So the reality is I think that one thing that we can continue to do and I continue to practice is checking in with people really asking thoughtfully before we begin anything, how are you feeling? And really listening and just holding that space. So I think that's something that I would love to see continued as you bring in the next fellow, having that space to just be. I think Nicoletta, one of those things is that, you know, uh, part of this is that I, we have um, throughout the fellowship and the, uh, multiple years, also acknowledge the fact that we are doing this as as arts workers, as as creatives, and acknowledge the fact that um, we are not doing this as anything but as artists. And how are we bringing our creative selves into this aspect? And one of the processes that I learned check-ins from queers, you know, like in the '90s, and that all those aspects were how like we needed to have these real check-ins to create space, which was quote to freely be ourselves and to fiercely be ourselves. And I think that those are the aspects in which if we want to continue to learn, how are we bringing our creative practices into our, our, our work practices into these other spaces in which um, that's gonna happen. And also how our artists not, like, as artists, we need to be able to acknowledge and recognize that these practices and these are the ways that we work and these are the ways that we want to work if we want to normalize the ways of being human. Uh, I think I, I also, oh. Go ahead, Sydney, go ahead, Sydney. Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, I, I love the, the quote that was shared earlier by Robin, I believe, um, but, but the part of the quote that mentions uh, live with the questions now um, really sits with me and it resonates with me. You know, I, I think about the um, instant gratification time that we're in right now, of course, due to social media, um, you know, something happens, social injustices happen, uprisings happen, and everyone seems to have a fully fleshed out thought within two minutes. And <laughs> that, it, it's never really sat right with me personally. Um, if anyone here knows me or has seen my social media, um, it's pretty slow on that side of the internet, um, and also pretty quiet because I want to do for myself and also for people around me to give everyone space, right? We've been talking about giving space a lot, but to allow for myself and for other people um, to fully process uh, their, their own thoughts and feelings and emotions and, and knowing that it's okay if you don't have a fully fleshed out thought within two minutes. It's okay if, if you know, after the murder of George Floyd, you can't make artwork for three months. Like it, it, that is okay and that's very real. Um, and I think it's important for us in these spaces, whether in institutions or outside of institutions, to acknowledge that people just need space and they need time to heal and to think. Yeah, the, to, to, that reminds me a lot of um, just something that also came up a lot during the beginning of the pandemic was artists respond to the pandemic, poets respond to the pandemic. And it again, there was this like, you know, the switch that was like, okay, this is happening. So now all these people, you know, now artists need to shift their work and then respond and create these products that are like, yes, this is the first anthology of blah, 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 poems about the pandemic. This is the first show of, you know, like paintings after the pandemic. And, and to me, that was so wild to experience because uh, just, I'm like, I, I was like, I was artists surviving. I was artists like trying to be, I, was a, I wasn't I was even responding. I was literally just art 
tis like trying to uh, exist one day at a time. And, and you know, that that's, again, like we do, th there is like a, this broader idea of art being a product. And, and again, that just was so exacerbated for me at the beginning of this pandemic. I think another thing too, you know, echoing what, what folks were saying earlier, um, there's, we engage in this level of unearned intimacy, whether it's through Zoom or through social media. And the fact that we don't acknowledge that um, or actually start to address it, I think has the potential to cause a lot of harm. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad both Nicoletta and Sydney, you gave like really specific examples about the ways that, you know, these things, there is this like, this idea, well, we're here, so everything is uh, up for grabs, but I think, again, acknowledging the level of unearned intimacy that we engage in and the, the potential implications and consequences of that, um, in, especially in, in virtual spaces, I think um, it, to me is, is really important. And, and lastly, I just wanted to share a little bit, and this is, you know, this is knowledge that I've gained and, and sort of reignited as, um, as someone who works within a language justice approach with with the um, you know with all of my work, whether it's interpretation, translation, creating multilingual spaces, but there's this idea um, about you know there's this idea of radical listening, right? And um, the language justice framework comes out of the Highlander Center in New Market, Tennessee. It comes out of decades and decades of struggle and and solidarity between uh, Black and Brown communities, and this idea that listening is not just this idea that by engaging in, in these conversations, we're practicing radical listening, radical listening that moves beyond the words, radical listening that moves beyond the specific language that we are um, listening to, but rather radical listening as a way to connect with other folks, right? Like seeing the seeing as a process of connection, not even understanding, not even communication, but connection in itself. And so I think this, um, you know, the, uh, another big lesson I'm taking, right, is like, how am I practicing radical listening, even outside of a space where, where I'm interpreting, even outside of a space where I am, um, where I'm not trying to build across languages um, and, and what that could feel like and, and, and be like um, in terms of my, my, daily, my daily interactions as well. So I wanted to raise up, uh, Joshua brought up a, a question into the chat. I think um, I, the, I believe like, um, if I get this wrong, Joshua, you can jump in. The affiliated artists, the, the fellows actually, uh, they, they did not need to hone in one, one medium. They did not need to hone in on a specific idea. I mean, the, the, the concept with Nicoletta and Jose Eduardo, like always was like, go back to the questions. What, what, were, what were you, why were you doing this? And in what ways are you doing like, and in what form is that going to take you? And I think that, like you know, with Jose Eduardo and with the, you know, and like Nicoletta was able to figure out and find the ritual and find the work, um, it, it was able to process that. And I think that you know, Jose Eduardo, like that there was a lot of things where, like, what were you trying? How do we do this? How does it actually have to be? And I think that there was a lot of kind of expectation of what what we as the fellows, as the institutional like partners in this fellowship thought it was supposed to be. And I don't think that um, I, it took a while. I think to hear like. We have no expectation of what that re like of what that what that outcome is going to be. The expectation is, how are you thinking? How are you thinking differently? How are you thinking harder? How are you thinking more generously? How are you thinking? How are you asking questions of yourselves and of each other so that as this form comes, it doesn't have to be anything. That's why there's never a a final project in this. In, in, in the fellowship, the final project is a conversation. A final like the 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 final project is. Can you share out your learning of over the course of the year to other people? And can you actually utilize it as like, this is practice-based work. This is not like, and a year means nothing in terms mm. of a career of practice, but a year is what we have to work with because that is what we have, you know, it, it is generated within this aspect. But within that period of time, can you actually reflect back to to a public and share what that learning has been. And then also, we've also asked like our fellows multiple years out, what has your learning been around the fellowship after you've 
after the year, after two years, after three years? How do you share back with us as to what is that learning and what have you learned differently? What have you learned more? And I think that, you know, part of, that is an ongoing push for our evaluation about this fellowship and this type of work is that if we are actually investing in people and investing in communities, we're not gonna know that within a fiscal year. We're mm. not gonna know the results of that within an academic year, a, like a, um, a calendar year. We have to be invested in time and in people. And we need to continue to revisit that and revisit the learning and know how as organizations and institutions who are learning that we are different from what we were when this fellowship started. That we are also uh, reflecting upon the learning that every, all the fellows are bringing to us. And hopefully we are doing better. We are doing better by our artists. We are doing better by our communities and we're doing better by each other. Sometimes, as we said, practice, we're not always, like it, it, it takes a little bit longer for institutions to follow up. But that is also one of the things and why we are talking about these as stories and as conversations, because it is about iterative the learning. So I want to say something real quick, Sixo, because you really like, thank you for asking this question. And I just want to have a conversation with us as creatives in general about really what it means. Like this, programs like this, I'm an artist. So we're no longer in a system where we have patrons. That was the way artists functioned, right? You had a patron who would give you financial support, maybe studio space, also access to materials, so you would just create. So this concept of researching was baked into life. Now, often we have these asks where we're going into spaces and we're asked to create something a project at the end of it so you're like given like a like a, a timeline at the end of this you must create and give it to us what this is is not that i'm given resources financial let's be super clear i get a stipend i am creating something in the world but i'm not being asked to make it right this second i'm given space to think and feel and experiment and explore and have conversations with other fellows like Jose Eduardo and just talk about things. This is important. We need to have more of this where artists are given funding to think, to experiment, to explore, to create if it feels good and to share, like you said, Sixto, at the end of the process, what happened. Because I will tell you, Sixto, when you reach out to me in a year, I'm going to let you know what I'm doing. I'm going to be doing mm -hmm. a lot of things. But what I was given was the space to do as much or as little as I needed to right now. That's what this is. And without measuring, but sharing. And so I want to explain why that's super important. We need to be mindful. We need to have conversations. We start talking about money and how those things access to funding so that I know that I can feed myself and pay my rent and go to the studio, that's real. So I love these beautiful kind of bigger conversations, but I also need to get down to the brass tacks sometimes because we as creatives need to have support so that we can thrive, not survive, thrive. Because I'll say this, the world needs us. The reason why the world was saying, please tell us what to do is because we as artists are showing the world where it's supposed to go. But we also need time to just experience so that the language that comes out of our bodies through our practices is something that someone else can get something from. Yeah, I, I love that, Nicoletta. And I definitely want to echo that, right? Like, the truth is, like, I would not have been able to get through last year without the stipend from the fellowship. I mean, just literally, like, everything Nicoletta said, paying rent, uh, bills, like, putting food on the table. And that is such, I mean, that was a huge, huge blessing for me. But sadly, that was just something that so many folks didn't have access to. And at the same time, like, I, I, I was talking to and checking in with a lot of my artist friends. And the irony was that they were telling me like, wow, I'm actually, I've gotten more money um, through these relief grants this year than I have like as a working artist, 
right? And so again, like this, I, this, these contradictions in the way that um, <laughs> that funding runs through um, the, this type of work that is a really it's it's a key piece, right? Um, it's it's a key piece because we're also human beings, uh, and we're essential human beings in, in our communities and in our and in our world. So yeah, so I agree completely with Nicoletta, and I think it is absolutely necessary to uh, uplift that, right? Like material conditions are important. Material conditions are what inform so much more, so much else of what we do. So yes, all all of that. Thank you, Nicoletta. <laughs> I mean, like, let's be clear. Like uh, Ryan and I, and all, you know, and all of us who, like, when we created the fellowship, that was part of the radical um, experiment that we needed to, that we were putting forward. We had to justify to an awful lot of people as to what this was, like that, that there was there wasn't going to be a product. Like, no, there's no product. This is a research fellowship. We don't ask we don't ask faculty members to like turn like you know after their after their their, their one year sabbatical to like, like well where, where is the book why 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 isn't the book already done I'm like no part of it is like yes you're supposed to be doing research and it is actually being able to move things forward to it so it was part of the radical intent in this it is not the way that our it, it's not the way that our our, our our capitalist society functions and nor will it continue to like will it yet be the immediate way for our capitalist society to function we are continuing to do this as an experiment. We're continuing to, like, we're investing in this. We're trying to get the, the impacts and demonstrate why it's important. That's what part of this conversation is about. But we also need to acknowledge that we, we're not doing it alone. And you all can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. And how do we continue to move forward in this and continue to work for uh, work with this and work within our structures or actually some of us need to work within our structures. I will say that. There are others who most likely, there are others who can operate outside of the structure and that is like more pow like power to them. How do we continue to build these and work together in order so that like all of the work that we are doing actually like actually frees all of us. So I think on that moment and that note, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, take, take, uh, take the time to translate this into 2021 and our fellowship and actually say that it is now time for us to introduce um, all this and all of the learning that we've been talking about, all the learning from the multiple years of the fellowship, all the learning and the adaptation that has been required of the fellows of the organizations and of us in this past year is leading us into what are we looking for for 2021. So Sydney, I'm going to open it up to you in order to talk about the essential changes of 2021 and introduce our 2021 fellow. Thank you, Sixto. And thank you, Jose, Eduardo, and Nicoletta for this amazing conversation. Um, I think there are a lot of gems all throughout. Um, so for 2021, um, those of you who are familiar with our fellowship or if you're new, uh, we typically have two fellows. Right, that's what we've seen today with Jose Eduardo and Nicoletta. Um, it's usually been one local fellow um, and one national fellow uh, to uh, bridge the conversation, but also expand the conversation of what um, social engagement of what community based work can look like within third ward. Um, of course, with COVID-19 um, and traveling being a little bit more um, difficult. Um, we have decided for 2021 to welcome one fellow instead of two. Um, this is, of course, to keep our community safe, um, their community safe, as well as they're traveling back and forth, um, and just want to make sure that we're doing this as responsibly as possible. Um, another change uh, that came from our learnings of 2021, uh, we spoke about a lot in our conversation, but it's slowing down um, and giving the proper time needed um, for anything, right? So um, for this incoming fellow, instead of announcing in the fall, which we typically do, um, we will be announcing today, uh, which is technically spring, I think. It feels like summer in Houston, but I think it's still spring. Um, <laughs> so we are announcing them earlier to give them proper time um, to adjust, 
to think about what this fellowship could be and mean for them. Because um, in the past, in the fall, when we announced them later in the year, we then had the holiday break to think over. And then we would reconvene in January and kind of get to work. Um, and we acknowledge that the world, as well as we, do not move that way anymore. Um, we want to allow time and grace. Um, and so it, it is a little bit longer in that sense, um, but we just want to make sure that everyone feels uh, ready to do the work that we are seeking to do. Um, and with that being said, I'm so excited to announce our 2021 KGMCA PRH fellow, Siobhan Morris, uh, who is on the call with us today. Um, before I pass it to Siobhan so that she can tell you a little bit about herself and her prior work, I do want to say huge congratulations to you. We are so excited to work with you um, and to support your work for this next year and beyond. So Siobhan, you now have the floor. I'm muted. Um, thank you guys so much. Like honestly, and I hope everyone can hear me, but Sydney knows because she was the first person that I talked to when getting the news. I was, I was flabbergasted. Um, this is an incredible opportunity, and I'm beyond like beyond excited and ecstatic about ecstatic about getting to work and being a part of such a great lineup um, of all the artists. Not just last year, you guys are incredible, but since you know 2017, I believe, just incredible artists. Um, and so, yeah, a little bit about me. Um, I am, I consider myself a visual artist and printmaker. Um, I also pride myself on being a mother and wife. Um, and since childhood, really, I have been interested in the art of words. Um, I won the 1997 Reading Rainbow um, Young Writers and Illustrators Award Contest. So <laughs> I've always kind of been an artist. Um, and that led me to get an art degree from Columbia College, Chicago. Um, so that uh, that's, our school is known for being um, Kanye West school where he did college dropout. Like our, we're the school where he dropped out of, apparently. <laughs> um, so I went there and I um, eventually went into um, a marketing and advertising career. Um, I worked in an ad agency right out of college. And I just felt like, I need, like, I, I need to do something more meaningful. I'm an artist and I'm not into, you know, at the time that it was like Occupy Wall Street was going on and overthrow capitalism. And I definitely joined, jumped on that train. <laughs> so um, long story short, it led me ultimately to become a teacher here in Houston. Um, I joined AmeriCorps and then came down to Houston, got certified and worked in not third ward, but Acres Home which is very much, if you're from Houston, it's a very similar dynamic. Um, and so growing, learning those kids, um, seeing how incredibly talented every single one of my kids were, and the fact that they didn't have resources, um, it just pushed my art practice. Um, and so I'm very much inspired by literature, social reform, um, syntax, and now the exploration of paper and printing. Um, so recently I just completed, just in January, um, completed an, an artist residency um, with the Printing Museum Houston. Um, and I can put a link to my website and you can kind of see um, my work and how it's been expanding. Um, and then from there, I was also featured in Shout Out Houston, Texas, which is a, um, it's a local magazine for emerging artists. Um, my work, if I just to just to give like a brief description of where where my work is right now, um, I specialize in a technique that combines like heavy relief printing um, and abstract messages. And so um, I'm also bringing a little bit of photography into that as well. Um, but the goal is to like visually express the constant subconscious reality of being a black woman in an unaccepting white world. Um, and so this has led me to explore themes centered on identity, faith, escapism, um, these kind of things, you know, that we're struggling with, and of course, place. Um, I seek to kind of emphasize the overbearing impact of like whiteness on society. 
um, it's kind of like in your face and it's a little bit choking. Um, and so right now in my printmaking practice, most of my work doesn't, I don't use any inking colors. Um, and so I focus on like impression, form and shadow. So I just take a white paper and press heavily into that because I feel as though we are hidden behind this white gaze, um, this white shadow really. Um, so that's where we are now, but the work that I submitted, long story short, the work that I, the proposal I submitted, what I'm seeking to explore um, in this fellowship is examining the concept of home in America, um, but specifically home as a refuge. Um, just with my own experience during COVID, but even before COVID, becoming a new mom and things like that, our household, we went through a big shift. Um, and I'm to this day, it's only by God's grace that we're still a family and like, whoo, everything is pretty <laughs> now, but um, it definitely was a struggle. And I know that during the pandemic, I would read countless articles every single day, YouTube videos of people who didn't have food, standing in long lines, you know, every lights were cut off. Um, so this pandemic has really exacerbated the things that were already going on in the home. And I'm wondering, where does that leave the family now? You know, are some families as a result of that oppression thriving? Because sometimes that happens. The more you're pushed and the more oppression, it creates like these roses, th these flowers out of that. So I'm really interested in diving deeper into that um, and doing it through printmaking, but also expanding into any other art forms. I know it's not project, project based, but I am visual. And so I kind of need something to work my hands while working my heart. And that's all. That's me. <laughs> Thank you. All. Thank you, Siobhan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys so much. We are so excited to be working with you and excited about your work um, and excited about um, the conversations that we're going to be having over the course of the next year and and hopefully the conversations that you'll be able to have with um, the communities of the university of uh, project row houses of third ward and the communities that we're bringing together virtually here today um, thank you <laughs> thank you it's exciting to so know. yes Nic nicola can i say something real quick because I'm, I'm processing like siobhan you see my face <laughs> You cracked my whole heart open and you were like, hey, Nicoletta, here you go. Hold it. <laughs> Listen, I see you. I appreciate you. I am now a super duper fan. Oh. I just want to say I'm sending you so much love oh. on this journey. Soak it in, mama. <laughs> I hear you. And <laughs> ooh, like you literally, you made, I'm sorry, sis, I apologize for, I, you cracked my whole core open and you gave it to me. And you were like, here you go. And that's it. That's what you said. Thank you. Ah, oh, peace. That is said. Peace, love. Like that is so. That is so beautiful. And I'm inspired by absolutely everyone on this call, from Sydney to Sixto. I mean, trust me, I've definitely looked up all of y'all, and everyone is incredible. For even the people who you know haven't turned on their videos, like I just want us as creatives to like push the door down with whatever medium we have. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicoletta. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you for sharing. And like Nicoletta, I'm like, right, as if you like, you don't need to apologize. <laughs> Nicoletta, Nicoletta just Nicoletta us. So it's all the way it's going to be. <laughs> and uh, she's going to lead with her heart always. And we appreciate oh. how, how that's going to like, how, uh, you know, what that learning will continue to be. Um, you know, and I think this is part of like, you know, as Siobhan said, like part of this is going to be an invitation to how do we continue to build community in order to support Siobhan as, as she goes through the fellowship? How do we continue to, to and, and when I say build community, this is actually, it's not just like, oh, but, you know, we're here to support you. Support is gonna look like exactly like Nicoletta just did, like said, you open our heart, we're listening to you. But also I got questions too, Siobhan. How, like, how, are we, how are we working through this? How can our mutual learning actually get us to a place where we're all better, we're all learning, and that you know some of this part is which you know continues to be challenging to each other and to like to ourselves as we move forward. Um, and you know, and I think that this is part of the ongoing part of the practice, ongoing part of the process. 
how are we making sure that we are open and we are challenging ourselves to be open in this process and making sure that we're responding to the community and not just the community that we choose, but the community that we need to be responding to. Mm, yes, so beautiful. And I'm again, just so ecstatic. Um, thank you guys for all the support on the onset. Like, that's crazy. I was talking to Sig like Sixo and Sydney a couple of days ago and they're like, yeah, and we'll try to, you know, push this out. We'll do like um, some press, some press releases on it. Hopefully it'll get picked up in the news. And I'm like, what? You know, I'm just so, <laughs> So flabbergasted. So it's truly a joy. So, um, and, and, you got, you oh, I was just going to say that I know that this is the end of this chapter for Jose Eduardo and myself, but please know that this is a family. I need to say that one more time. <laughs> one more again, Siobhan. <laughs> this is a family. So if there's any way that we can be supportive of you on this journey, because we've been on a journey similar, not the same to yours, please do reach out because that is what we have to do as artists and as human beings is remember that you can connect. So you have an extended family that is down Baltimore, say hi, <laughs> that you can reach out to. Jose Eduardo is, is in Houston, much closer, but you can reach out, please do, okay? I just wanted to say that as well. I absolutely will. And interestingly enough, I have been listening to Baltimore club music ever since this Netflix show, baby. Netflix posted a show and I was like, what is this? It was all about Baltimore and the arts in Baltimore. And I have been listening to this Baltimore club music, honey. And I'm like, wow. So <laughs> anyway, I thank you so much. And I'm going to be reaching out both to you, Jose, Oz uh, Jose Eduardo and you, Nicoletta, um, definitely because I'm, I'm kind of in this solo. I don't have that partner. So yeah, and I, I just Nicoletta, as always, read my mind. I was about to type that on the on the chat, but but I want to articulate it. I want to say it out loud um, again. Siobhan, welcome to the family. And as Nicoletta said, like, we want to be here um, to hold space, to talk, to just, you know, uh, check in and, and yeah, and uh, I am a Houston, so uh, also oh, okay. any way that it makes sense to connect in person or virtually or however that makes sense, just echoing that, um, what, what Nicoletta said, and, and thank you again for, for everything you've shared today and, and for all your offerings. I'm, I'm so excited to to continue to yeah to to be in community and to learn more about you and and to get to know each other thank you thank you okay so um i'm gonna be the mean one and actually acknowledge that they have time acknowledge <laughs> the fact that uh that we do exist in this world in time and there's a clock that some of us all have to pay attention to so this is like, uh, like we are going to end the virtual conversation and that know that there are going to be more conversations that are going to be had offline in person and you know and and over the course of, of time and not just you know within this virtual space um, I encourage you to check out like you know uh, PRH's uh, website PRH's blog cases website um, and then we in order to to get more information about Siobhan how things are going to be moving forward um, and that also we will share a uh, Jose Eduardo, um, we've like we've shared Jose Eduardo's uh, email, like uh, website in the uh, in the chat earlier. We've sh like shared vi like Nicoletta's uh, Vimeo page earlier in terms of the movement reflections. So we will continue like you know, keep track of them, keep engage them, and keep the conversation moving for with them. Thank you all very much for um, joining us this afternoon. Thank you for being part of this, for being present with each other, with us, you know, and each other, um, and, and all of us as we continue to learn, as we continue to push this fellowship and to demonstrate that you know the what the learning can be, and continue to build community around this. So thank you all very much. Have a great and wonderful afternoon, and power to everybody. <laughs>